What's in your ears? All right. What's in your ears? Just because you're old. Oh, no. What? I'm just saying, do kids still say earbuds? I have no idea. All right. Well, you're the one with kids. I have no idea. You have two. I have one. Kid. I have Singular. one kid. I have one kid. You had one swimmer. One swimmer. Welcome to the pre-show. <laughs> Welcome to the pre-show. Where am I? I'm looking for a book. Here it is. I had a chance to meet a Polaris winner, Cadence Weapon, and uh, get this uh, book signed. Yeah, look at you. By him. Bedroom rapper. Future guest on the podcast. It's signed. Excellent. Look at that. Thanks for coming through. Yeah. Also got... Uh, Why thanks for coming through? Uh, what did you do for him? I'll ask him. I'll ask him. I don't know. Okay. This is Michael Barkley's book, Hearts on Fire. You need to watch this podcast, by the way, on our YouTube channel. Yeah, you do. You get very lost with the way he does things. Kareem, thanks for all you do and the great chats. I think you forgot to write, put your name down. Yeah, he did forget to put my name. Yeah, yeah, I don't know why he didn't. And then he signed He signed this one. You know, the three weeks before I get his podcast up. And Hey, careful. This one, I think he was thinking of you. He wrote, Kareem, this book is for the old farts. Not you, of course, but I hope you love it. So Michael Barkley. So for those of you listening to this podcast, go to the previous one. Give Michael Barkley a listen. He's been on. Uh, he only comes on when he writes a book. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, looking forward to uh, to reading Bedroom Rapper. But um, I also bought some new vinyl mm. as well, like new for me. So let me uh, let me show you in no particular order. Cat Stevens, Cat Stevens, greatest hits. Good choice. Thumbs up. There's a there's a joke there, but I'll leave it. Okay, go tell the joke. Cat Stevens has greatest hits. Oh my God. Whatever. Tina Turner, private dancer. This is a good view. Anyways. Your favorite band, Greg. Greg, you ready? Five. Yeah. There's a meaning behind <laughs> this one. Thompson Twins. Yeah. For yeah, those of you who don't know, my first concert was with the Thompson Twins and uh, OMD, and I can't remember who else. New Regime. Uh, New Regime at the uh, Maple Leaf Gardens. Yep. Uh, I can't remember what year, but it was a New Year's Eve show. Probably that, 88. That a young Greg Kilston that. was also yeah. present at. It was. Yeah. 87. Yeah. Jimi Hendrix, Smash Hits. Nice. Yeah. Two more. I'm sure the people at home are riveted, right? Bruce now. Springsteen, The River. Yes. Yeah. This uh, double vinyl album. I would ask the same question if it was the greatest hit, but go ahead. And then Max Webster. Nice. Million Vacations. A million Vacations. Featuring Fantastic former guest album. Kim Mitchell. It is. Yeah. So looking forward to that. And I got some, uh, I was going to buy vinyl when I was in the UK, but I just had no way of carrying them back. I didn't want to put them in the suitcase. So some, uh, some CDs I got Oasis and Nebworth, 1996. Nice. Foo Fighters, The Big Day Out. This is uh, a broadcast concert in Sydney, Australia. It 2000. Is. Big Day Out is Sydney. Yeah. Festival that happens each year. Yep. Prince, Small Club 1988. So after, is very, 
while when he was doing concerts, he used to do a concert and then he used to go somewhere else and just play like a small club or a small Where was bar. That recorded? Uh, this was re- this is a classic after show party. Written, da, da, da. Uh, broadcast recorded in Netherlands, 1988, August 19th, 1988 in the Netherlands. This is the Rolling Stones. Rewind, 1971 to 1984. This looks like a, uh, a Japanese release. And then... By the way, when we get to... When, when, uh, no, you two people can see what you're showing. Blue by Joni Mitchell. Which, uh, yeah, I, I did we have not... very differing tastes. I did not very, want to get the very vinyl. Very differing tastes. Because it was so expensive, but when I saw this, that's a CD. Yeah, yeah, CD for people for people at home. For he was people. holding up a CD when he said, "I did not want to get the vinyl." Go ahead. Yeah. So yeah, recent music purchases. Perfect. Yeah. And uh, yeah, go out and buy some uh, buy some music. Yep. Buy some vinyl. Go, go support some independent yeah. record stores. Go yes. and buy some your favorite music on vinyl. Yep. Go buy it on CD if you want. Just go buy it. C- cassette? You can buy cassettes still now. Cassettes? Not still. Like I like some like I think Liam, is it Liam Gallagher put out his recent uh album on cassette. Mm. So you can go go online and buy it. There you go. Looking forward to our guest this week. Uh, she's a singer songwriter. Her parents are singer songwriters. Her name is yep. Lulu Simon. And uh, exciting to excited to speak with her. She's going to be uh, coming in from, I believe, LA. So this will be a very exciting episode. It will. To have uh, Lulu Simon I'm, on. I'm looking forward to this chat. Yeah. And that's the pre-show. And that is the pre-show. Hi, the following podcast is brought to you by Radical Road Brewery, the best craft beer in the heart of Leslieville. Find them at 1177 Queen Street East. That's Radical Road Brewery. Okay, so here's what we want you to do to start things off. Okay. Introduce yourself, your name, who you are. You talk about the new album if you want very quickly. And then, if you can say the name of our show, which is Welcome to the Music. Welcome to the Music. Yeah, so my name you is know what, You Simon. know what I noticed? You, this, like, this season, and we're, we're on the second episode of this season, but third. he usually has one of those, third. like, third, third. third season, yeah. second episode, third season. Who's counting? He usually has this, like, you know how the, all the Instagram, exactly, oh, that's oh, always up in the background to help, and he's, he's blown it now. Yeah, third episode, three times now. Oh, hold on, Greg, wait. All right, all right, all right. Just thought it helps. Here Just helps. Go. Lulu, Greg and I are not married. We might bicker like we're an old <laughs> married couple. But we're, we're married. Can you see that? Yes. All right. Yes, awesome. I can. <laughs> Perfect. Are we good to go, Lulu? Yes. All right, awesome. Whenever you're ready. Okay. Hello, my name is Lulu Simon. I've got an EP coming out um, on October 7th. It's called Muscle Memory. It's about a bunch of sad stuff that happened (laughs) during um, those first gorgeous months of quarantine. A lot of self-reflection. And this is Welcome to the Music. Welcome, welcome, Play. welcome, welcome. <laughs> exactly. Perfect. Thanks. Awesome. We're, Thanks we're so excited us. to have you. Yeah. Thank you. I'm uh, excited to be here. Yeah. So you're in LA. Yes. But from New York. Yes. When did you make the move? And um, why? I moved. Uh, I'm actually coming up. I think I may be two weeks away from my four year anniversary. Okay. Um. I moved to LA to, to pursue music. I lived in New York for a year after I graduated from college 
and um, I was trying to to make pop music, but it was kind of right at that time where there was it was the start of sort of a mass exodus of like pop producers moving mm. from New York to LA. And I, to be honest, I did not want to move to LA. I felt um, that I was very East coast and like, I didn't belong here. Okay. I was like They don't get me. Um, but I didn't, <laughs> I didn't feel like I had a choice. Um, so I moved oh. not knowing anyone here pretty much at all. Um but I like it. I don't think I could ever go back to the cold. <laughs> Fair enough. My sister just moved uh, outside of San Diego after oh, yeah. living all her life in Toronto. And she, every time I call her, her hair is looks so beautiful in the sunlight. <laughs> and uh, she's wearing shades. She never used to wear shades. <laughs> and uh, yeah, everyone's in t-shirt and shorts. And I'm like, why do you have to answer the phone this way? Can't you just, you know, just pick up by your voice. I don't need to see that you're enjoying the weather out there. Yeah. So, so no plans to going back to New York. No, not anytime soon. Yeah. Maybe one day I can be fully bi-coastal, but not today. <laughs> no, fair enough. Um, was there like a pressure to, you know, to succeed which is why you moved out west? Was there that like if I really want to make this a a thing and make a go at it, I need to go there? Not necessarily. It was more it was more so that the people that I was working with, I was specifically working with this one producer, um, Andy Seltzer, in New York. And um, we were getting along very well. And I think at the same time, we both sort of realized that all of the people that we would want to work with in New uh, York were making the move to L.A. So it was not like, oh, I have to go to L.A. in order to succeed. It was more like I have to go to L.A. in order to make the music in the first place. Yeah. All the people you wanted to collab with. Yeah. Were out there. Yes. Awesome. So if they moved out to like New Mexico, you're headed down there. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> no. And LA girl. You're drawing a line. Yeah. yeah. Fair enough. So your new EP, Lulu, Muscle Memory, mm -hmm. uh, will be released October 7th. Yes. There's already a couple of singles out, something. And I think your first one was Being Alone is the Best. Mm -hmm. Um. I have a bunch of questions that I want to ask you about the album, the songs. Uh, but my first question is around releasing an, an EP and releasing these singles like well in advance. Uh, one of the things that Greg and I have have been asking, especially um, younger musicians, uh, you know, not established musicians yet. Um, you know, what you think of, you know, are, do you think of EP, LP singles? You know, how does, how do things like Apple Music and Spotify fit into the planning around this? I'm really curious around, you know, what you as an artist think about when it comes to releasing music. I think that releasing music can be very stressful. <laughs> mm. Um but I think it, it is stressful because of like the streaming process of everything where it's like, if you want your music to be heard, then you have to get put on a playlist. And okay. in order to get put on a playlist, like it just, nothing is guaranteed. And it's, I think so much of it is about like playing the game. And I think for people who are newer artists and who are independent, it's like, I don't really know. I don't know how to play the game. <laughs> like, yeah. I don't know how to get playlisted. Like, is it sh like sheer dumb luck? Is it like, are there people who are like pushing my stuff ahead for whatever reason? Like, I don't fully understand. And I just recently, well, I guess it's been a year now, um, started working with my management and it's been so, so helpful. I think doing stuff on your own is, is really hard. Mm -hmm. And I think that there's such um, there's such a disconnect for me um, between 
like creating the music and being like, oh, this is a great song. I love to listen to it. And then being like, oh, now other people have to listen to it. How do I even get it in front of them in the first place? Yeah. Hmm. So now you figured out that game? No. <laughs> no. That's no. what management is there for. Yes. And I do think that though that like aspect of it um, informs how people release music now. Mm -hmm. Okay. You know, if you release an album and nobody knows who you are, like, what are the odds that they're going to listen to every single song on there? Like, very, very slim. So mm -hmm. I think that the way that music is listened to now sort of dictates how people release and it encourages singles. It's like release one song at a time so that it like stands a chance of getting heard. Yeah. And I think, I think, I think part of it too, and, and, and I know Craig mentioned about younger people, like a younger musicians, but even some of the, you know, up here in Canada, we have Alexis on fire and USS and bands like that, that are older guys, my, our age, pretty much, maybe a little younger, maybe more like Kareem's age than my age. Uh, but, uh, but I mean, they're now at the point of their careers where that's what they're doing. They're, you know, they, they just like Alexa fire just did an album, but they release singles and just, you know, get together and make music and enjoy it and, and release it. So, yeah, it's an, yeah. it's an interesting, it's an interesting time because you're right. You know, you can put an album out. People are going to listen to the, you know, the, the hits, the hits, the whatever, right. The, the, the popular songs on Spotify, they're not necessarily going to go deep into the yeah. album. I also think that like, I mean, I'm like this too, where I'm not going to, listen to someone's entire album if I don't know who they are. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to be like, hmm, I've never heard of this person. Let me listen to every single song <laughs> here. Like, you just listen to one, and then if you don't love the one that you choose, like, are you going to be inclined to listen to more? Like, not necessarily. So, yeah, it's, a weird, yeah, it's definitely a weird time. Absolutely. And by the way, I'm just going to let you know that that crash you just heard in the background is the dogs coming through the door. So, anyway, just, yeah. <laughs> so we're going to have to pause, Greg, and introduce. <laughs> we'll play, we'll and play a bit of the beginning. Yeah, anyway. Um, one of the things that I want to talk about, you talk about, you know, being alone as a musician and then bringing in management. But, the, you know, the, the 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 song being alone is the best. Um, it it was, as I, as I understand, it was written during the pandemic but it's obviously not just about the pandemic. Um, how much of it sort of was influenced by one or the other? And can you tell us a bit about the song? Yeah, um, I started writing it actually like directly before um, everything shut down and then finished it during. Um, but before lockdown and everything, I had... Um, two roommates, and now I do not. <laughs> um, and I just had like a very um, unhealthy relationship with them. And I think because I thought, you know, the pandemic started in 2020. I moved to LA at the end of 2018. So I only had a year of like trying to meet people and make friends. Um, before I was like alone for two years. So I feel like I, I got in kind of with the wrong people that were like mm -hmm. not the kind of friends that um, I needed or wanted. And I was feeling very unmoored and disconnected. And um, I was experiencing social anxiety, which I had never really felt before. And, um, I wrote that song kind of as a means of self soothing. Um, I was like, would I rather be with people who make me feel small and stupid <laughs> or huh. be by myself where I can, you know, do whatever I want. It doesn't matter. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's kind of what the song was about. It was, you know, trying to, trying to trick my mind into thinking that it's it's easier and more comfortable to be by myself where I am safe <laughs> than to be around other people that make me feel like dookie. Fair enough. Fair enough. Appreciate that. Thank you. So Lulu, there's three questions 
that from my understanding, your friends never asked you. Maybe it's these two friends <laughs> in particular. So let's ask you these questions, all right? Okay. <laughs> so number one, what's your middle name? It's Jean. Okay. Where does where does Jean come from? It's my grandma's middle name. All right. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> Tell us about your grandma. Um, her name is Larry. Her name is Larry. Larry. Yes. Larry. Okay. She's the best. She's my grandma, Larry. <laughs> Larry Jean. <laughs> Larry Jean. All right. She lives cool. in Texas. She taught me how to make fried chicken. All right. She's the best. Nice. Uh, what are your favorite songs? Oh, um, you get what you give by the New Radicals. Okay, great song. song, great song, great song. Mm-hmm. I think Dela by Johnny Clegg. Do you know that song? <laughs> I love that song. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. There's so many. All right, but. But that would be two of them. Two, two of the top five, I would say. All right. And then the final question is, tell us about the creeds that you grew up on. Oh, you know, just be nice. <laughs> I, feel like, <laughs> I feel like I see people do, doing things and I have my mom's voice in my head going, didn't their parents ever tell them like, not to do that? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think about that all the time where I'm like, didn't anyone ever tell you? <laughs> like, what the heck? So... Has your mom ever told you that? Have she, has she ever asked you that question? Didn't we ever teach you that? I'm sure she has. Yeah. Sure that, it, that it embarrassed me, so I blocked it out of my You blocked memory. it out. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Um, so that was the first single, Being Alone is the Best. The second one was Something. Mm-hmm. And my question is not necessarily about the song, but maybe there's a tie-in there. But you've got this thing with frogs. Yes, saw and, that. F- and frogs <laughs> like you have. I think you've got a f- a finger puppet frog in that oh, video. The thing about that frog, who that frog's name is Terry. <laughs> that is Terry. Okay, Terry. Terry actually belongs to my younger brother, and I was like, my younger brother's name is Gabe, and I was like, Gabe, can I please use Terry for this video? I need him. <laughs> All right. So, but I do um, love frogs. So where, where does this come from? And I guess your brother loves frogs too. Maybe it's a, a family thing. No, I don't know why he has Terry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, my frog thing started during lockdown. I was quarantining with my parents and my grandma. And okay. I thought, oh, this is going to be great. I have all this downtime to like really focus on music and just write and like write hit after hit. Um, did not do that at all. Like didn't touch my guitar for months. Um, and I'm not like, um, a painter or anything, but for whatever reason, I was like, I don't know why, but I have to paint frogs (laughs) and I have to do it right now. And I basically for like two months, I painted like a frog a day. (laughs) Oh, wow. And it was like basically just the same painting with just different colors. But every time I painted that frog, I like didn't know exactly what like the facial expression was going to be. And they, uh, they brought me a lot of joy. They were really making me laugh. Okay. And then it became a thing where I was like, wait, frogs are so funny. I love them. And then it was like, everyone was like, Oh, th- I saw a frog and it reminded me of you. And I was like, oh, okay, well I'm just the frog lady now. The frog lady. <laughs> that could be Better like than the cat thing. lady. Yeah. For now, maybe one day I'll be a cat lady. <laughs> yeah, you know, I never know. Um, you mentioned your brother Gabe. I know your 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 two brothers. I don't know about Gabe as much, but I know your brother Adrian and Harper are accomplished musicians in themselves. Mm-hmm. Um, have you had much opportunity to work with them? To play? I mean, obviously as a family, I'm sure you all played together. But you know what I mean from, from a professional yeah, perspective. Yeah, um, I've actually worked with um, my brother Adrian a lot. He, I think, is probably the the person I trust most in mm. in terms of music okay. just ever. He's so talented and has really an incredible ear. And um before I started like releasing pop music, all of my music was written first like on the guitar, or on the piano, very singer-songwritery. 
and I love pop music and I wanted to make that transition into making poppier sounding music. And uh, I had kind of a hard time in the beginning because Mm. the style that I was used to writing was very like rambly, storytelly, no discernible chorus or anything like that. Um, So actually the first song that I ever released, um, it's called Wasted in 2018, my older brother co-wrote that with me and he he ba- he like made that track and then Andy Seltzer who I mentioned before um produced it out and made it bigger but I I run a lot of my stuff by him I always run my mixes past Adrian <laughs> he he always knows what to say that's awesome mm-hmm. you've said uh Lulu in the past I would rather do things the hard way and make music I want to hear and hope and pray people like this pop music the way I like it. Um, tell me, tell me about that. Where where did that thought come in? That you know you hope that people would enjoy your pop music. Well, right before I moved to LA, I actually um, I had a meeting with a potential manager who. Um, really disappointed me. Oh no. <laughs> um kind of broke my spirit for a second. Um I played him wasted. I played him some of my like er- early demos. And he told me that I had no edge and that I was too precious that the music I was making was too precious to sell. And he was like, "Yeah, people really identify with edge. Like you don't have an edge." And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> I was like, yeah, totally. I don't have an edge. Right. <laughs> um, and I was upset because I was like, sorry, I'm well-rounded. I don't have an edge. <laughs> um, and then actually there's a, there's a band called Caro Caro Bonito. I don't know if you've heard of them. And they have a song called Trampoline that's just about jumping on the trampoline. And I was like, this is not an edgy song. And this song like goes so hard. I love this and Mm -hmm. it makes me happy and it makes me feel good. I don't need to write like music doesn't need to have an edge in order for people to enjoy it. So I think part of me was like, who the, the people who want edge, like those are then not the people that I'm writing for. I'm writing for the people who are like me. I can't be the only person on planet earth Mm. that like wants to hear the kind of music that I'm making. So, okay. and I think also like being in LA, there's such a formula to writing pop music. And if you don't follow that formula exactly, I think a lot of people don't exactly know what to do, um, what to do with you. So like, I don't see like where this fits in, in the, the current pop landscape. Yeah. But I just also think that that's like really underestimating listeners and people who enjoy music people who like pop music like people don't want to hear the same thing over and over and over again and it's also like not everybody wants edge like some people (laughs) want to hear a song that's easy to listen to (laughs) fair enough yeah Yeah, for sure um it's funny i was i was reading i think it was a rolling stone uh, article that referred to the song wasted as being reminiscent of carly ray jepsum and it had some some 41 in there and i thought that's a lot of heavy heavy canadiana influences in there if you ask me not saying that, that they were your influences but when i read that i'm like wow that's a lot of canadiana i guess you're right <laughs> carly ray jepsum is my favorite she's my queen i'm seeing her in a few weeks can't wait in concert um, or like one-on-one concert okay <laughs> seeing her one-on-one she doesn't know it yet (laughs) um no yeah i sampled some 41 and then uh avril lavigne was actually my first concert so really the list yeah where did you see her i don't even remember i was in second grade so this she was touring oh my goodness she was touring her first her first record i remember it so vividly she was wearing a red t-shirt and camo pants that makes me feel old. You were in so second cool. grade. 
So wow. I, yeah, I was in second grade. She must, she was like 16 or something. Okay. I need to ask you this random question. Okay. Um, so you're the third guest of this season. The first two guests, it just happened that we had to ask them about this band. So again, this might be so random. Greg might have to edit it out. Okay. Uh, there's a, a rock band in Canada and there's a, um, there's an Avril Levine connection. Uh, the band is called Nickelback. Have you heard of Nickelback? Yes. Okay. So, oh, big Have smile. You heard of <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what people listen to these days. But let me see what I told you at the beginning before we started recording. Hey, like I don't know. Sometimes you just go, yeah. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> okay. Love them or leave them. Um. Me personally, I'm gonna have to leave them. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> And that's all I'm going to say. Fair enough. That's, fair enough. That is fair enough. <laughs> um, I need to ask you about this song. Okay. Um, and maybe it's one of your favorite songs. Maybe it's not. I don't know. But as we were doing our research, I came across the song Father and Daughter. Mm-hmm. That your dad, did he write it for you? I guess he wrote it for you. Or it was a song to you? Um, what's I think about. About you, yeah. Yeah. Um, what's your relationship with that song? I love it. Yeah? Very nice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you catch me at the right time or the wrong time, depending, it will, yeah? it will elicit tears. Oh, really? Yeah, because I listen and I go, my dad really loves me. <laughs> That was such an amazing song. And the video is is so cute. I don't even know what the video is. It's called like it's cartoon, it's, cartoon yeah, character. It's, it's wild, from, it's, wild thornberries. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And <laughs> it, it's funny because when I was on YouTube looking at it, it was like, is these dads going, oh, it reminded me so much of my daughter. And like all these <laughs> like happy stories and sad stories. I'm like, wow, I went down a rabbit hole on this one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, so you're in grade, you said grade two, Avril Lavigne. Yes. You're what, five, seven years old? How old is grade two? Seven or second grade? Seven. Seven? Uh, seven or eight, I think. Seven or eight. You're six years old and you said you wanted to have written Lucky by Britney Spears. So why, why that song? And then like two years later, you're going to go see Avril Lavigne, the edgy Avril Lavigne. Um, I mean, Lucky is such a good song. <laughs> that is really a great song. And it's a great music video. Britney Spears looks so good in it. I, I mean, I love Britney Spears. I really, mm-hmm. I loved her a lot. Um, I don't know. I guess my music taste knows no bounds. Yeah. It's just, mm-hmm. you know, it depends on the mood. Sometimes I'm... Sometimes I'm a sad pop star who just wants to be a normal <laughs> girl. Other times I'm a little, little punk skateboarding around the mall. You can't pin me down. I don't know what else to tell you. Nice. Um, let's talk about lost venues. Okay. Uh, so this segment, Lulu, is about a venue you may have played in. Uh, that doesn't exist anymore, but that you've got either a crazy story, a bad story, a funny story. Wondering if there's any of these venues in your life. There's only one venue that I have played at that now is no longer a music venue and is just like, I think a bar restaurant and that's the satellite here in LA. Um, nothing crazy happened there. I played my second show ever there. Okay. But that's not that's that exciting because I've only played like four shows <laughs> ever. So it's not that exciting, but I played there. And then I think later that same year, um, or maybe it was right before, they had like a, a Halloween party. Mm-hmm. And I went, um, have you seen th- that movie Labyrinth? David Bowie. 
Yeah, yeah. Yeah, of course. I went as Hoggle, <laughs> the goblin. <laughs> I was wearing um, a, a goblin mask. And I went in and the bouncer at the door was like, you have to take that mask off. And I was like, yeah, definitely. I will. Um, but as soon as I got inside, I put it back on. <laughs> and then I was running around. They were playing ABBA. I don't know. People were like, I don't like that person. <laughs> Get her out of here. She's scaring me. And then a month later, I went and played my second show ever there. Nice. So that's yeah. my story. What songs go. did you play there? Do you remember? Um, I played, I think, every song off of my first EP. Uh-huh. And then I covered a song by the 1975. Mm -hmm. Okay. Nice. Cool. Nice. So so you mentioned that you haven't played a lot of shows. I mean, that's not um not, not traditional is not the right. What's, I don't, I'm trying to think of what the word is. I mean, Normal. you know, it's not expected. Like it's expected. So, like, does management? You know, you mentioned got working with management. Now, does management expect you to be doing that? Do do the fans of the music expect you to be out? Um, I think if I had fans, <laughs> then they might expect that. I think that really what happened was I released my first EP at the end of 2018. Mm -hmm. Played two or three shows over the course of 2019 and then everything shut down for like two uh, years. Yeah. So I played one show um, last summer, um, but then I was working on new music and I just felt like I didn't really want to keep playing shows where I was playing music that I released a few years ago. Mm -hmm. um, especially because mm -hmm. I was only, you know, just playing around LA. It's not like I was touring or anything. Yeah. And um, all the people that were coming to these shows in LA were my friends. It's the same, basically the same yeah. people who are nice enough to come and hear me sing the same five songs like over and over and over again. So I felt like I needed to take a break with trying to play shows and release music so that I have new songs to play and hopefully, you know, renewed interest in me. That's enough for people to want to see a show. Yeah, that's great. Um, during, during the pandemic, were you doing like online? It's like a lot of, a lot of musicians started doing that because again, that was a way for them to make some money at least during the time. Right. So <laughs> or at least, at least build a fan base. No? Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, I was, you know, I would like play a song and post it on my Instagram or whatever. Yeah. But I I was really um, unmotivated during mm. those first couple of months. I felt mm. really sluggish and um, just like kind of generally annoyed with myself, um, which I think a lot of people felt um just weird <laughs> during that time yeah. and then that's really when i shifted my focus to painting frogs so <laughs> i wasn't doing a lot of music stuff I was really focusing on my art yeah it's funny we've talked to a lot of musicians and my lights are flickering here so i have no idea during the storm whether i'm about to lose power internet but um i know you're out in scarborough so you're you're safe you've got all the electricity you guys need out there <laughs> uh and there it goes again um so where was I going to go with that? Uh, yeah, no, it's interesting because we did we've we've talked to a number of musicians and, and like established musicians yeah. and and up and coming musicians who said like uh, Stephen Fearing, who's a big folky blues or rootsy kind of guy out of uh, out of the West Coast, and like he said for the first I guess six months or whatever he just couldn't pick up his guitar, couldn't play. Like a lot of musicians have said, I can't do it. Yeah. And then there were other musicians that just felt that downtime was so their time they 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 leverage that time to do a lot of writing during that time so it's a real mix you know and again it's it's yeah. as as artists you everybody's an individual from that perspective yeah i also think that that downtime really forced me to look at the way that i approached writing music mm -hmm. um i used to be very staunchly autobiographical and i felt that if i was writing something it had to be 100% true. Yep. And, you know, during all that downtime, it's like nothing is happening. I don't have anything to write about. And um, it was actually when Taylor Swift released Folklore mm -hmm. that I was like, oh, you can actually write 
about anything and it can still feel very honest and like people can still connect with it even if it's partially fiction or whatever and then I think that Mm -hmm. sort of felt like I gave myself permission to um, explore songwriting um, in a way that wasn't 100% autobiographical Mm -hmm. Um, but then I think that helped me to you know write songs that were autobiographical because it just sort of like broke the seal and when you're when you're writing songs is it is the music coming to you first the lyrics first is it a mix what's what's your process um it's kind of a mix but i think that mm-hmm. you know i'll i'll usually write music and lyrics at the same time mm-hmm. um and then keep that music in my head and as i'm just performing my daily tasks I write a lot just in my brain. Mm-hmm. Um, I wrote something actually the entire chorus and second verse, just completely away from my instrument. I was walking around and it hit me and I was like, okay, wait, maybe this is going to work. I ha- I don't know yet. I have to put it to music. And it did, but I think actually what ha- what'll happen is I'll come up with like a line and then go to, you know, whatever instrument and, see if I can find music that feels appropriate. Yeah, oh, fair enough. That's so, um, nice. so, so, so I guess as a singer songwriter, you know, and, and I hope you don't ask, I hope you don't mind if we ask if I cream and I were just in the background going, do we ask, do we not, you know, again, we don't want to go too much into your parents, but um, can you talk about the influence your parents had on you as a musician, as a singer songwriter? Uh, I think that, Really what they have shown me is that there is a genuine like degree of excellence to strive for. Um, I think that a lot of people um, make music and get excited about having like finished a song or they want to immediately release it. I think that a lot of people um, want like the instant gratification of, you know, write, write a song, release it, see what people think. And, um, I, for some people that works and, but for, you know, I think a lot of the times I listen to music and I think like, you maybe could have spent like another week on this. (laughs) I think you could have like edited this here or there. And so I think that just, you know, the way that my, my parents have made music and the way that they write, um, I think the way that I apply that to the way that I make music is, I think this is not as good as it could be. This, like, I don't want mm. any fuller lines mm. because I know that there can, it is possible for there to be songs that are really beautiful and meaningful all the way through or mm-hmm. tongue in cheek or whatever. You know, I just, yep. I, I'm very aware of what I'm saying and I want to make sure that I don't ever just write something so that I can get finished sooner. How do you deal with that pressure? Like, or is it pressure or is it, maybe it's not pressure for you. I mean, it's, it's more of like, you know, an internalized pressure. Cause I, cause I also think like, you know, I don't want to write something and then look back on it in a few years and be super embarrassed by it. Um, I want to know that like I'm doing the best that I can where I am Mm -hmm. that way. If I ever look back on something, I can go, well, no, that's not what I would have done now. But at the time, like that, you know, whatever. But I I also like, I don't necessarily feel that way now. I think a lot of music that I've written years ago, I listened to now and I'm like, this song is good still. (laughs) to me. Nice. Nice. And it's all a process, right? Yeah. And I think it's also, you know, it's just a way to, to push yourself to become a better writer. And that's important to me. Wonderful. So Lulu, you're going to play a song for us. Yes. Nice. What, do you want to uh, introduce the song and tell us about it? Yes. Um, I'm going to play a song I wrote um, 
during the pandemic. It's called Driftwood. Hmm. Um, when I was quarantining, I would go for a daily walk just as something to do. And um, I was quarantining away from friends, away from people my age. I was with my parents and my grandma. And I was feeling um, crazy. <laughs> I felt totally nuts. I really missed um, my friends and my brothers. Um, and I was walking um, along the beach and I saw a piece of driftwood and I was very emotional and it made me cry. Cause I was like that piece of wood, like used to be a part of a tree. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, that's just like me. I used to be a part of something and now I'm alone. <laughs> oh my. So that's what the song is about. <laughs> awesome. Here is Lulu Simon from the EP muscle memory driftwood. <laughs> Listen to my favorite record over and over again The one we played when Emma came to stay For the weekend, arms around each other Singing along to Lana at the Bowl Malibu in October Running wild and dancing on the day I think we woke the neighbors And now I'm driftwood Oh, I used to be a part of something good But now I'm driftwood drift home if I could I listen to my baby's record over and over again the one he wrote but never showed me we had potential then first day of the summer I said goodbye and meant it, didn't I? Save her to be strangers. Sat in the backyard and swore I wouldn't cry. This is the last time. Cause now I'm driftwood. part of something good but now I'm driftwood and you know that I would drift home if I could I miss you more than I thought I would I miss you more than I thought I could I miss you I miss you Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was awesome. <laughs> this is always the best part. <laughs> so, so Lulu, um, one of the questions we'd like to ask our guests as we're wrapping things up is what's in your, your 
earbuds. We were we were talking about those earbuds, ear pods. What what you're do the kids so say anymore? Old, we're, Greg. You were the one that asked <laughs> Greg, the question, Greg, not me. You asked this question. I didn't ask it. Lou, you just it asked it right now. Me. Well, yeah. We could just like here. generalize and say headphones. What's yeah. in your ears lately? How's What's that? in your ears? <laughs> that's that's a personal question, Greg. Um, that honestly is a what great. What should question. people be checking out? I'm yeah. going to be looking right now. Oh, you know who I love right now? It's this girl, Chapel Roan. I'm obsessed with her. All right. She's got such a great voice. She's really making um, really wonderful pop music. It's so fun. And I just saw her um, a few weeks ago. Great show. I love her. Obsessed with her. Um, I don't know. Let me see. Chapel Roan. How do you spell Chapel that last Roan. name? R O A N. All right. She's great. She's got a really great voice. I think she's about to go on tour opening for Fletcher. So nice. she's great. Um, I don't know. I'm looking forward. There's a new Carly Rae Jepsen album coming out in a month. Of course. New Taylor Swift in a month. Mm -hmm. I have my calendar marked. <laughs> <laughs> Um, honestly, right now I'm really just listening to my own EP. <laughs> Good. Fair enough. Fair enough. So, uh, so when you when you buy new music, are you downloading it? Are you buying vinyl, CDs? What do you do? Um, I'm an Apple Music user. Okay. So I'm downloading it there. Nice. All right. We were, we were the reason the reason you asked that question is we do a pre-show. And uh, it's it's fantastic for the listeners who aren't watching this on YouTube when he's just like pulling out vinyl after vinyl, like you just all the stuff he's bought. And so, yeah, just this weekend. Yeah. What do you yeah. got? Uh, so Max Webster. OK. Uh, old, old, old school Canadian. Like old school Canadian. Days. The River by Bruce Springsteen. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. Jimi Hendrix experience. I don't know if you've heard of these guys, Thompson twins. Mm -mm. You can check them out. <laughs> okay. Check them out. This is my first ever concert. I like their font. Yeah. Thompson twins. What would, what would that be? Greg pop? Like, new wave. No, it was new wave. It was poppy new wave. Eighties pop. Eighties new, new wave. wave. Yeah. Tina Turner. Tina, one time when I was in middle school, yeah, um, I didn't have that many kids in my grade, and I used to make um, like personalized Valentine's Day cards for everyone. Okay, for attention, I wanted to be like, yeah, I made Valentine's Day cards for everyone, <laughs> each individual, and but I would sort of like run out of ideas, and I remember I made one one year, and it was like a drawing of a fish in a sparkly dress. And I was like, Tuna Turner, what's that what have to do with it? And I remember I like handed it out and then I saw it in the trash later. Oh, no. Like, wow. No respect for Tuna Turner. <laughs> okay. Wow. I see how it is. That's like a wow. classic Valentine's card. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. Greg, can you, February, can you send me a Valentine's card? I will. Tuna I will. Turner. <laughs> Tuna Turner. <laughs> okay. And then finally, I got this. Cat Stevens. Wonderful. Greatest hits. Greg, Greg poo pooed this. He said, Cat Stevens doesn't have any greatest hits. I made a joke. <laughs> I made a joke. No, no. Sure. I know. If it's I not know. loud, then you don't like it. I get it. I get it. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, Lulu, this has been fun. Thank you so yes, much for joining you. us. Of course. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, did we miss anything? Was there anything you wanted to make sure you chat about? No. All right. I don't well, think so. <laughs> well, let's remind everybody. Yes. October the 7th, new EP, your second EP. Yes. Muscle Memory comes out. Uh, go to wherever you download and stream music. It will be there. Yes. Awesome. Lula Simon. And yeah, go ahead. Before you go. Uh -huh. If people, because this is his job, because he blew it again. I, I haven't finished chatting. No, you were about you were about That's to edit. If people want to find out more, hold on, Lulu. This is all you do. Let me see if I can mute him. No. <laughs> I'm looking for a new co-host. 
wondering if you wanted a team up and you and I could host this podcast. Yes. East Coast, West Coast, leave the old guy alone. <laughs> we can chat to people in LA, New York, East, it'll be great. I'm in. Okay, sounds great. Greg, it's been a blast. <laughs> I've already um, got my feet up here. <laughs> go to lulusimon.com for more uh, music from Lulu, as well as all her socials. And I think it's Instagram that uh, you're most active on. Would that be correct? Yeah. I don't, I don't, I'm scared of TikTok. TikTok's where it's at. I got, I posted a couple of things on TikTok that have blown up and I got sniper bullied. <laughs> well, get out of town. I posted like my frogs and people were like, your frogs are stupid. <laughs> I was like, it's like going, it's like people go back to grade four or something. That's why I hate so I remember I did, I posted um, a video of myself playing one of my songs that will be on the upcoming EP. Mm -hmm. And someone commented on it and said, very average. Is this your job? Holy shit. And I said, I mean, I don't get paid or anything, but. <laughs> <laughs> oh. How badly do you want to like swear at people and like just give them the finger? Like, oh, I, I respond to all of the mean comments. Yeah. I just go, very mean. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Good for you. Good for you. Awesome. Lulu, we wish you the best. Thank you. Uh, in your career. And we wish that uh, all of the trolls um, just lose their voice and lose their phones. Yeah. Yeah. Lose your phone. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> that works. Lulu, this has been a blast. Thank you so much yes. for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.